This cosmological model was conceived when a simple thought experiment unexpectedly produced a scenario that mirrored the accelerating expansion of the universe when the intention was to better understand general relativity and the curvature of space and time. In this typical diagram of cosmic evolution, the cosmological principle assumes that the universe is homogeneous and isotropic viewed at a large enough scale. If light were instantaneous everywhere, it would look like it does here. But with more distant light, we see a younger, less evolved cosmos. And the first stars and galaxies form here. And with the oldest light, we see our baby image. And we call this the cosmological arrow of time. So I'm compelled to call this observational aspect of time cosmological or cosmic time. Travelling at the speed of light, time for a photon of light stands still. So when the light left here, it travelled with the present without ageing through the cosmos that did. Light always travels from the past to the present and we call this the electromagnetic arrow of time. We know from general relativity that gravitational time dilation means that the clocks would be going faster at the top of a building relative to the bottom. That also means you get more time between Monday and Tuesday in the penthouse during the day than you do in the basement. The day is universal to both locations and over millions of years their calendars will never go out of sync. Observationally, cosmic time is universal, but how we age and derive the laws of physics are divergent. These are two distinct aspects of time that are also coterminous, not unlike the distinct dimensions of Cartesian geometry where X, Y and Z depict a single location. And because clocks are running faster at the top, we would be travelling slower through the day up there and therefore faster through the day in the basement. Currently in physics and physical cosmology, the very definition of time is what a clock reads or to be more precise, a cesium atomic clock. We call this proper or atomic time, but this on its own is not universal. It is simultaneously variable and infinitely so in the gravity well of a black hole. Atomic time varies depending on how fast we are traveling through cosmic time. The atomic time difference in a building is tiny. Even if the building were this tall, there would only be a difference of 45 nanoseconds more time at the top over a day. This distance is where over a thousand geostationary satellites orbit. We could build a space station there and service it with a Tchaikovsky type space elevator. The speed of light is a universal constant, so you would think that the distance a photon can travel in a day from this space station relative to one propagating from the Earth could go further with that extra 45 nanoseconds, an extra 44 feet 2 inches. Not a lot when you consider that these photons would now have travelled beyond the boundary of our solar system. Although we do not know the one-way speed of light for sure, we do know how fast it is when reflected back to the emitter's clock. So what we can say about the coordinate speed of light is that it is relative to the frame of reference of the observer and so the time and distance asymmetry is a relative one between that of the observer's reference frames. Alfredo G. Oliveira in his 2011 paper, a self-similar model of the universe unveils the nature of dark energy under the heading base units are not independent points out. One must not confuse quantity with its measure. The length of a ruler is defined by the elapsed proper time a photon takes to transit a ruler. And so our SI unit of length is also based upon the time property of an atom at any specific location. As Oliveira says, while the concepts of length and time are independent, their units are not. The measurement of both space and time are both peculiar to the observer's time dilation. The coordinate speed of light is apparently faster at the geostationary space station relative to the speed of light on the Earth. Therefore, a time-dependent ruler there will be relatively longer than one on the Earth station. The result seems paradoxical, 
as the distance from the space station to the Earth and back is shorter than the distance from the Earth to the space station and back. Descend the elevator and you are descending into the Earth's gravity well. If the coordinate speed of light gets relatively slower, then your light speed rulers get smaller. This also means that you and your rulers, along with the atoms that we are made of, must be shrinking as we descend. So as we descend the elevator, our shrinking rulers will make a distant galaxy move away faster. The further away the galaxy, the faster it will be moving away. Obviously this expansion of the universe is fictitious and requires no energy, not even as it accelerates as you approach the Earth. Being based upon gravitational time dilation, the expansion caused by descending the elevator is instantaneously different to both the space station and the Earth, and is therefore only relative to the elevator's frame of reference. Yet this assumed local effect seems to mirror in a self-similar way the homogeneous accelerating expansion of the universe. And indeed, at rest on the Earth, the universe continues to expand as if our clocks were still slowing down over time and that we are therefore travelling ever faster through cosmic time. If time is slowing down over time, then this is no longer a local effect. It is universal and a dimensionless parameter of change. With time slowing down over cosmic time as the parameter to causally induce the uniform shrinkage of our rulers and the divergent atomic time that tells us how fast that shrinking occurs locally, we can make a naive scalar cosmological background dependent model where space tells matter how to shrink and matter tells itself how big that space is. And with larger rulers and relatively more time in the past, much larger structures could emerge while still keeping the universe homogeneous and isotropic on the largest of scales. Relative to space, the matter energy density remains constant, whereas the shrinking gravity bound matter makes space appear ever more rarefied. Being geostationary, the Earth and the space station agree about the degree of rotation at any now moment. Their light speed rulers may disagree, but they shrink in unison. And so the divergent time and distance between the Earth and the space station must equate to the simultaneous position of the distant galaxy. The extra time at the space station is equivalent to the extra distance on the Earth. Because Earth has less atomic time for the same expansion, the Hubble constant will be measured faster there. If the cable were a tape measure, the distance would be universal. If the compass was a 24 hour clock, then time would be universal like the calendars are and all observers could agree to the ordinality of events. If we were to privilege these observational properties of time and position, we could interpret events with a background dependence and agree on a now moment in time. Not only would it unveil the nature of dark energy, but it may also simplify the unification of general relativity and quantum mechanics. So travelling slower through cosmic time in the Lagrange L2 point where these instruments operate, we should measure a slower Hubble constant than we do with Earth-bound telescopes, but not as fast as space-bound telescopes in a low Earth orbit due to special relativity effects of travelling at such high speeds. These predictions represent a possible solution to the Hubble tension. The Hubble tension arises from two fundamentally different ways of measuring the Hubble constant. One involves studying the early universe and the cosmic microwave background, and the other more traditional way with classic Cepheids, or Type 1a supernovas as standard candles in the later universe. Note that as instruments became more accurate, the two methods produced more divergent results. This may not be due to any intrinsic difference between the two methods but one emanating from a point of view of the location of the instruments used. In the Lambda Cold Dark Matter model, the light from distant galaxies gets stretched as it passes through the expanding space. The blue spectrograph line represents static starlight and the red spectrograph line represents similar light from a distant galaxy being stretched. 
the distant galaxies have moved their relative positions due to the apparent creation of more space. In this model, the light hasn't changed, but the universe around it has. The more the universe has changed since the light left, the more redshifted that light will appear. We are blue shifting our way to the future. The faster we travel through cosmic time, the more redshifted that past appears. This model predicates a background dependence to positional locations that is independent to relative atomic spacetime measurements. The expansion of space is relative to the shrinking observer. In this model, this equation represents the distances relative to an observer. Although the position may not have changed since the light left, the apparent distance has. Some of the extra time of the past has become extra distance today. Although the components of atomic spacetime change over cosmic time, they sum to the same background dependent position. Z in this equation represents the difference in nanometers between the wavelength of starlight today compared to the light from the observed galaxy. In this very distant galaxy, where the wavelength is twice that of today, the value of Z would be equal to one. The Hubble constant is the expansion rate of the universe is the rate that distant galaxies are separating. It's about an extra 70 kilometers per second for every megaparsec of separation when measured on Earth. It sounds a lot, but a megaparsec is a huge distance. And if the Earth were shrinking this fast, it would be less than a millimeter smaller this time next year. One method of calculating the age of the universe is to take how fast two distant galaxies are separating and extrapolate back to when they would have been together, which is just one divided by the Hubble constant. We have to rationalize the distances and turn the seconds into years, and it works out to be about 14 billion years. But that method assumes the expansion of space is changing the actual position of the galaxies and making the assumption that the flow of time is invariant as we run the clocks backwards. When we calculate the distance of the galaxy at Z1, we get a distance of 14 billion years, and that's the same number we got for the age of the universe, but in this model, that's not surprising. With no actual commoving change in position, the light year distance and how long ago the light left are equivalent. So, if Z1 is 14 billion years, then the oldest light, the cosmic microwave background, is nearly 1100 times older and further. Z1 is the distance that galaxies have an apparent recessional velocity equal to the speed of light. This is called the Hubble sphere. Everything beyond the Hubble sphere is superluminal. And because nothing is actually moving due to the apparent expansion, nothing is actually exceeding the universal speed limit. In 1937, Dirac had such a model called the large number hypothesis. Dirac made the observation that related the ratios of size scales in the universe to that of force scales. The ratios constitute very large dimensionless numbers. According to Dirac's hypothesis, the apparent similarity of these ratios might not be a mere coincidence, but instead could imply a cosmology with these unusual features. The strength of gravity, as represented by the gravitational constant is inversely proportional to the age of the universe. The mass of the universe is proportional to the square of the universe's age. But one has to remember that the age in these equations represent the age of the light that left the galaxies that are now at the edge of our Hubble sphere. And as you shall see, that is also a constant, held constant by cosmic time dilation. In Oliveira's 2011 model, the constants of nature remain constant as the universe evolves with the Hubble constant, as the single dimensionless parameter. But what I am proposing in this model is that time is of itself the same type of single dimensionless parameter, and as such, a similar yet novel approach with the Hubble flow as an effect 
rather than the cause and frame dependent in its proper time distance measure. Although independently conceived, discovering Oliveira's earlier, more professional work has greatly encouraged and augmented my understanding and helped me to further develop these ideas. The distance to the Hubble sphere is constant at Z1, but the position is not. The Hubble sphere is shrinking with our atomic time-based rulers. And like these rulers, the constants of nature evolve over cosmological time while staying constant in their atomic time distance measures. Our light cannot reach a superluminal galaxy, and so the Hubble sphere is our future horizon of causality. We can see beyond our present Hubble sphere for these objects were inside our larger Hubble sphere when the light left. Our Hubble sphere must have been larger than our visible horizon when the cosmic microwave background photons left the ancient plasma. With more time and a larger horizon of causality in the past, earlier structures in the visible horizon could have become much larger than current theories would allow today. When we think of space as expanding, a photon is just not fast enough to catch a superluminal galaxy, but in this invariant space model, it's not so obvious why this photon can't go further than this galaxy. The Hubble sphere is itself a constant, and so this distance is unchanging, but the relative position that this value represents is diminishing with our atomic rulers due to the time parameter. I have given the photon its own Hubble sphere in black. Eventually, all matter collapses to zero size and all atomic time stops. We will then have an effect, infinitely many black hole singularities and atomic time has stopped until the next evolutionary stage when black holes become white holes and a new phase in cosmic time begins. So far, we have negated the need for dark energy but we can also resolve the dark matter with the same parameter. To an Earth observer, the space station is further away in rotating about the Earth faster. To an observer on the space station, the Earth is closer and rotating slower. The differences here are negligible. But when it comes to our spiral galaxy that is 100,000 light years across or even more, the differences are more significant. How long it takes our sun to travel to here will give us our orbital speed, but a star thousands of light years closer to the centre of the galaxy with less time on their clock would be travelling faster even though it would appear to be stationary to us. A star further out towards the edge of our galaxy will have experienced more atomic time and therefore would be travelling slower than us. These are hidden frame-dependent variations in speed. Using the Doppler effect to determine the rotation of a galaxy, that rotation is relative to the local atomic time of the observer, and they will not see the hidden frame-dependent variation caused by any local gravitational time dilation that monotonically increases towards the galactic nucleus. We can expect to find such hidden variations in all gravity bound structures. You cannot divide infinity, but you can fractionalize it into infinitely many, and the universe does this with time. This gives the universe its fractal topology. In the same way that this wild carrot leaf has self-similar looking branches that we call levels of description, that give a geometric fractal depth to the structure. Time also has three levels of description, whose fractal depth give our universe its complex dimensional depth. The first being eternal time, where time is in an eternal fractal loop. This has similarities with Sir Roger Penrose's conformal cyclic cosmology model but with infinitely many aeons of time emerging from and to the Big Bang continuum. The second level of description is cosmic time, where 
the electromagnetic arrow reveals the evolving cosmos. How far down the cosmic fractal depth indicates whereabouts our aeon of time is on its evolutionary cycle. And finally, the third level of description, atomic time, where the rate of change simultaneously differs in the fractal depth of a gravity well or for a faster moving object. The faster an observer measures the Hubble constant, the faster their rate of change and the slower their atomic clock. In special relativity, to facilitate the constant speed of light for a moving object, it proposes a shrinkage in the direction of travel. But in this model, the shrinkage is the same isomorphic shrinkage over cosmic time relative to the dependent background and divergent in the instantaneous atomic rate of change. And so the spaceship would measure a faster Hubble constant as it shrinks faster in atomic time. In a diagram like this, the present looks like a hypersurface in a light cone diagram. How this exists is not now how we see it. It is all like the present and part of it, along with the photons generated in the past. But if the Big Bang never stopped, then we are separated from it by infinitely many less evolved time aeons that are still emerging. Unseen beyond our infinite present, like the aeons of time that emerged prior to our Big Bang moment, all in the present heading to their next Big Bang moment. As time cycles, our clocks slow down and our days speed up as we slowly head for the next Big Bang. The Big Bang is the interface of cosmic rejuvenation. Matter first emerges as a plasma before becoming transparent as primordial light elements during cosmological dark ages. Becoming visible in quasars and primordial stars, the blue spheres here represent the diminishing matter. But thinking diminishing time as the cause of gravity, it too is a kind of field. Which means this should look more like this torus. With the flow of eternal time, something like this, and cosmic time, evanescing the matter as represented by the spheres, each aeon of time sharing its genesis moment is instantaneously fractionalized further by atomic time into infinitely many bubble universes, with diminishing transfinite horizons of causality. This instant separation resolves the mystery of the charge parity problem. You see, the Big Bang should have generated an equal amount of right spin matter and left spin antimatter, so each transfinite bubble universe has its own distinct spin, with an opposite charge to one diagrammatically opposite to the other. As all matter and rulers shrink, past distances appear to tend towards the infinite, and future distances tend towards zero, where all matter and antimatter in that aeon of time converge at the interface, creating in principle sufficient reason for the Big Bang continuum, and time gets reborn to prevent everything from happening at once in the emerging aeons of time. A theory should not just fit with what we know, it should ideally make new testable predictions, and apart from the Hubble tension that it predicted before it was a thing, this theory should also predict that the mean solar day is getting shorter. With less atomic time at the base of a building, the same day passes faster locally. And so with diminishing cosmic time over time, the days should also be getting faster over time for all observers. The effect is so small, I thought it would be impossible to test. For one thing, the Earth is slowing down due to tidal friction with the moon. Then I heard Bianca Nogrady on BBC Five Live Science podcast talking about ancient observations of eclipses and occultations that reveal something unexplained countering that tidal friction. A small effect, but one that adds up over time. These scientists have taken the precise measurements of tidal friction 
and the rotation of the Earth as measured with atomic clocks, and use this information to calculate when and where we should have observed eclipses and rotations in the past, and found a mismatch with actual recorded observations. Taking a closer look at this diagram, this line represents the average observational records, and therefore represents observational cosmic time, and this line represents projected atomic time if it were invariant over time. But if atomic time is slowing down over time, making our day shorter by just 0.52 milliseconds per century, then the two aspects of time would be as coterminous over time as they are today.